Okay, um, what we're here to talk about today is the VMST dashboard public health performance management system. And the, the key in there is that it is, is truly a system that was developed with and for public health over the course of about the last 16 years. Um, what the dashboard is, is a comprehensive operational and strategic planning system. And what we found out over the years of doing a lot of consulting with public health, and by the way, private sector entities as well, is they'll go out and spend a, a bunch of time and a bunch of people's efforts to develop strategic plans, operational plans, and they'll put them in a book and put them on the shelf somewhere. And at that point in time, they'll never get seen again. So what we decided we, we needed to be able to do is to have a system that made those plans come to life and kind of almost forced you to keep them alive so that you can actually use the plans for what they were meant for, which is obviously planning your, your movements going forward. So we, we built this system uh, years ago. We started out using Excel spreadsheets, and that worked out pretty well, but it, it didn't grow with us. It didn't grow with a large health department. So we were working with, at that point in time, uh, Maricopa County Department of Public Health here in Arizona, uh, third largest public health jurisdiction in the nation. And Maricopa County uh, provided a lot of the internal expertise as we were going through the process of developing the system so that we could develop it, again, specifically around the needs of, of public health. Uh, the system is based in, in, at the core around the, the Deming or PDCA cycle, so plan, do, check, and adjust. We'll show you a, a real live example of that in a few minutes here. But the, um, the plan, do, check, act, plan, do, check, adjust, plan, do, study, act, whatever you call it, is kind of the core that, that keeps everything alive. So it's always going to take you back through the loop of keeping information up to date in the system. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Performance management versus performance monitoring. Um, a lot of systems out there who, who call themselves performance management systems truly are performance monitoring, which is great. Um, kind of half of our system is performance monitoring. So that once you have your plan in place and you start executing your plan, you obviously have to track the plan against, or track the uh, actuals against the plan to see how you're doing. Performance monitoring systems kind of stop there. Performance management then takes that, when, when things start going south, what do you do about them? And that's where the performance management piece comes in. We'll show you a live example of that here in a few minutes as well. Uh, one of the things that, that we're very proud of is, is we've been working um, very closely with health departments going through the accreditation process. And interestingly enough, we've had a lot of health departments who've come to us after the accreditation process. And you know, one of their, uh, not necessarily weaknesses, but you know, kind of partially met uh, things was their performance management system. And through the process, they realized the value of having a good performance management system. So they've come to us after the fact and said, you know, we'd really like to implement a good performance management system based on what we learned going through the accreditation process. So in fact, we, we have been able to sell it to people who, you know, who are not going through the accreditation process but have already accomplished that. Um, in each and every case where it's been used for accreditation, it's been fully demonstrated, which is the highest level of compliance uh, in the FAB standard 9.1. But the thing that, that we really like is when people engage everybody in the organization through this measure 9.1.1a, which talks about you know, involving people at all levels of the organization in the process. So we designed the system. It's a, a, it's a complete multi-user system, so everybody can access it at once if you want to. And what they'll do is they'll go in and keep their specific information up to date, and the system prompts them to do that regularly, and we'll show you that in a second, too. We also found out over time that Public health doesn't do it alone. Public health usually has a lot of external partners that they deal with, uh, community partners, consultants, contractors, and things who are, who are helping them to do the, the mission of public health out there. So the system also has the ability to track all of your external partners, as well as, if you choose to, allow some of them to come back in and actually access pieces of the system and keep information in the system up to date. Again, we'll show you some real examples of that. Um, one of the lessons learned in the, the back in the days when I mentioned we were doing Excel spreadsheets was the ability to look across all of those different plans. So if you got your workforce development plan and your QI plan, your strategic plan and your operational plans for each division all in the system, how do you look across those for commonalities? How do you look for things you know around FAB standards or around essentials of public health and, and where are you meeting that in the plan? So we came up with this concept called three-dimensional planning which basically allows you to categorize any piece of any plan or any document in the system against a set of standards so now you can go back and retrieve them against those standards. 
So show me all the documents that we're uh, using for FAB Standard 9.1. Boom, you got a list of all those documents that now you can go and upload into EFAB. So we'll show you more about that in a second as well. Uh, the last bullet on here, um, as we were rolling out the system uh, commercially, some of the first clients came back to us who were just in the process of you know, the initial accreditation process of gathering all the documentation together. And it was a pretty large health department, and they had you know upwards of 600 documents that they had to manage for the process. Um, what they said was, you know, we have a heck of a time just managing all these documents out there because we have documents scattered all over. We have a, a shared drive. But you know, not everybody keeps them on the shared drive. Then we got to go find the documents, and we got to be able to understand which ones are for you know which standards and measures and things. So what we actually did is we we talked to several different uh, clients, and it turned out that what they really needed was a document management system integrated with the performance management system. So we built this uh, document management system in. Uh, again, everything is cloud based in our system, so nothing resides locally for you. We keep it in our secure servers up there. You can get to it from anywhere, whether it's you know a home or office or out away at a conference on your mobile device. You got full time access to it anywhere you want, which also, by the way, includes all those documents. So now, if you're out someplace or working from home, you're snowed in or whatever that happens to be, you can now pull down that document, do your edits on the document, put it back up into the document management system, and away you go with the, the latest version of the documents. So. Document management is integrated into the system and allows you to track all those documents for your accreditation process and anything else that you want to do in public health. And when we say documents, you know, typically it's, it's things like Word documents and PDF files, but it can be anything. It can be audio files or video files, anything else you want to put up there. So that was the overview of, of where the system came about and, and how it was developed. Let's talk about how the system actually looks and what, how it's structured. So we, we like to equate it to a big pyramid. At the very top of the pyramid is your organization, typically your health department. Underneath that, we have what we generically call groups, and that's your org chart. That is your, your divisions, your bureaus, your offices, your programs, whatever your nomenclature is, generically we call those groups. And groups report to other groups, so you get the hierarchy uh, just like your org chart would be. So what you see at the top left corner up here is our little demo organization called USA Public Health. And underneath the, the organization itself are the divisions. So there's five divisions. Under the divisions would be offices or programs. So it's all structured hierarchically. So now I can build operational plans at the level they belong. So my WIC operational plan reports into WIC. However, since WIC reports to community health, I can look at everything at community health. I can look at the WIC plans as well through that um, scaling up through that pyramid, if you will. Back to our pyramid here. At the group level, uh, it used to be at the organization level, but now at the group level, you can determine vision, mission, and values independently for each group, should you choose to. Or if you want to roll them down from the top of the organization, you can do that as well. When we get down into the actual plans, the, the very top level of the plan is what we call services or initiatives. So we're going to roll over into the system here and look at some real examples here. So into the dashboard, I'm going to go to my groups tab up here. And these are ordered sequentially, just like that pyramid. So my organization, my groups, services, uh, goals, objectives, activities. We'll see that. So my groups tab, I'm going to select the Office of Performance Improvement. Um, Office of Performance Improvement is the, the folks who are responsible for accreditation, that sort of thing. So I'm going to go look at the Services and Initiatives tab that is for the Office of Performance Improvement, since that's who I selected. And these, in a, in a big bucket picture, are the things that OPI does. So creating a culture and practice for QI, implement an automated performance management system, achieve a FAB accreditation. So that's kind of the things that they're trying to accomplish as an organization. Now we're going to get down into more and more of how they do that. So let's look at the implement an automated performance management system, which is an initiative. And an initiative is kind of a future service, things that we're trying to accomplish and maybe things that we're not doing today. Down at the bottom, you'll notice when I click on anything at the top, it, it changes down at the bottom. This is where I edit things and, and save them and uh, update them. Um, the only thing we really have at the bottom is just a description of that service. So let's go back to our pyramid here. As we get down below the service, the service is the what we do. So just kind of a definition, very uh, slight definition of exactly what we're trying to accomplish here. Underneath that, we have goals, objectives, and activities, which are 
increasing detail on how we're going to do that service. So we're going to start out with the goal. So let's go back to our live system. So I have this uh, initiative around implementing an automated performance management system. Now, since I selected that service, my goals tab is lit up here. So I can select the goals tab for that particular service. Underneath here, I have three goals. And my goals are, number one, research existing systems. Obviously, makes sense. Uh, meet with IT to see if we can develop a system in-house if you have that capability. And number three is check with management on budget availability. So whether you build or buy, there's going to be a budget consequence to it. So you might as well have somebody from, from finance involved in that. So now let's look down at the bottom. Since I've selected research existing performance management systems, everything down here reflects that. Um, you'll notice I have the actual goal statement down here, the same as you see at the top. I have a status flag now. So every planning element from here on down will have the same status flag. We call it traffic light plus. The, the plus indicating the gold bar. So traffic light is green, yellow, red. The plus is a gold bar. Uh, the gold bar indicates successful completion. So we're tracking how we're doing against our overall uh, service that we, we put in there. So in this case, you know, it shows the gold is that we've successfully completed this piece of it here. Green indicates, as you'd expect, everything is, is up and to the right, moving forward. Yellow is typically caution, uh, meaning that we believe that something may be going wrong, like maybe we're going to run out of money, or maybe we have a, a resource who might be leaving the organization. Nothing's happened yet, but we're going to we're going to mark it as caution because we want to be ready if that does happen. And, and then red is is whatever you thought was going to happen actually did happen, and things have come kind of come to a screeching halt here. So red, yellow, green, and the gold traffic lights will be you know kind of throughout. Down at the bottom right, we have, and, and you'll see this in, in every one of the planning elements, is a notes field. And basically, it's just a running dialogue. So anytime you make a change to this particular goal, you're going to put a note in there as to why. So down here, we have a note that says, uh, change to yellow due to concerns about funding. So what you're doing is telling everybody else why you click it to yellow. When they look at it, they don't have to call you and say, hey, why would you click this to yellow? It's, there's a note in there that describes that. Obviously, as much detail as you want. And it's a running dialogue. So uh, research existing performance management systems is our goal. Now we've selected that, so our object objectives tab is highlighted. So we're going to click on the objectives tab. It's going to take us to the, the three objectives for that specific goal about researching performance management systems. Uh, one thing you'll notice at the objective level, we start putting the objectives in a smart format. So they're specific, measurable, attainable, time-based, et cetera, realistic. Um, so up there we have, by a specific date, we're going to contact FAB for recommendations. By a specific date, we're going to do a Google search for performance management systems. Uh, by the end of June, we're going to contact at least three other public health departments. So you'll notice down at the bottom we have kind of the same information we had at the goal level, plus we have now the ability to assign an objective leader. So going back to our pyramid, the objective is made up of a set of activities, whereas the goal is made up of a set of objectives. So the objective leader is probably not the person who's actually going to contact the three other health, health departments, but more than likely a program manager, uh, maybe division or office manager, somebody who's going to make sure it gets done by managing the people who are actually going to do the job. So that's typically what the objective leader is. Uh, it's very simple to select and change the objective leader. I just click on the little down arrow here. First thing it, it does is pop open a view of the people within my group. So you notice these are all OPI people, my selected group. Um, however, should I want to assign the objective leader outside of my group, maybe an IT person or somebody else, I just click on the Show All Users button, and it's now going to show me everybody in the organization, and I can select anybody that I want as the objective leader in here. Uh, everything else is the same. You get your notes field. So anytime I make a change in there, I'm going to put a note in there as to why I did to get, uh, facilitate that communication. So um, by the end of, of June, we're going to contact three other public health departments. So the activities for that would probably be much more specific, and we'll go look at those. So the activities you see here are the specific health departments we're going to contact, who's going to do it, and when we're going to contact them. So you notice we have contact Maricopa County, La Paz County, Franklin County, State of Mississippi, who are all current uh, clients using the dashboard. Uh, you'll notice down at the bottom we have a bunch more detail. So let's go over that. Uh, the same status flag, the traffic light plus here. We have the activity description. And you'll notice these rollovers. Every time I mouse over something, it's going to pop up a little mouse over window to kind of give you 
uh, a little bit of help maybe as to, you know, what am I going to be putting in this particular spot here? So it's just kind of an ongoing help thing. Uh, we have three types of activities. What we're going to talk about initially is what we call a project-based activity, which is the simplest type of activity. But there's also the ability to put in quantitative measurement and quality assurance activities. I've got a slide in a minute here that will describe those for you. But a project-based activity is pretty much defined by a beginning date, an ending date, and a percent complete. So the beginning date and ending date are obviously, you know, typically maybe the beginning of the fiscal year, end of the fiscal year, and your percent complete is your uh, estimate on how far along you are. Now, project-based activities, because they don't have a, a specific target that you're reaching, for instance, um, develop an operational plan for WIC might be a, uh, an activity, but it's project-based because, first of all, we don't know how many services, goals, and objectives we're going to end up having there. So as I'm developing, and I'm going to kind of keep track in my mind that, yeah, I'm about halfway done, or I think I'm 75% of the way done, but you, know, you don't really know until you get to the end that you're 100% done. So it's more subjective. Uh, we have a performance metric here. Performance metric is just how do we know when we've successfully completed this activity? So in the case of contact Maricopa County, when we've contacted them, we've successfully completed it. So just a definition of that. Um, obviously, the note's down at the bottom, so anytime I make a change here, I'm going to put a note in. Now, down at the bottom left, we have a couple of unique fields. Uh, the first one is activity and team, activity uh, leaders and team members. So when I click on the little pencil icon, it's going to take me to a screen. The initial screen shows me the um, people within my group again. I'm in OPI. So the people within my group, and you can see that Diane Cox has been selected as a leader, and we have Diane and Mara as team members. But if I want to expand that and maybe start forming cross-functional teams here, um, I'm going to be able to expand that and go to everybody in the organization. So now you'll see that Diane is my team leader. And by the way, I can only select one team leader, as you notice. So if I select another one, it clears everybody else. So one team leader and as many team members as I want. Uh, think about the idea of implementing a performance management system. Who else do you want to have involved? So if you think about it, in a system that, that might have to be installed locally, which ours does not, um, you might have to have IT involvement, for instance, because obviously somebody's going to have to install it across everybody's computers. Uh, even in a cloud-based system like ours, you're going to probably want IT involved from a a bandwidth point of view and a security point of view, that sort of thing. So maybe you're going to attach somebody from IT to this particular activity. Um, obviously, you know whether you build or buy, there's going to be a financial component. So maybe somebody from uh, administration or finance, you know, would be attached to it as well. So what you're doing basically is building the team of everybody in the organization who's going to be contributing to this activity and who the leader is of that team. So now I'm going to go back to our activity screen. Uh, down at the very bottom, I have the ability to, now this is where we select external partners. So again, clicking on the pencil icon, it's going to take me to my partner screen. And on my partner screen, at the left side, I have the partner organizations and sub-organizations. So much like my grouping in, in my organization, I can have a uh, hierarchical partner organization. So in this case, I could have um, Assertive Solutions is, is KCA's parent company. So I had uh, KCA as a sub to Assertive Solutions. And when I select KCA, I can see all of the contacts. In this case, I have Fred Erickson as the contact with KCA. So I can select a, an organization, uh, a division within the organization, an office, or I can select an individual person as the partner. I can then also make these people, should I choose to, give an access to the system so that they can update a very specific area of the system. So if they're, if they're attached to this activity, you might want to give them the ability to come back in and update the quantities or something along that line for the activity. So that's pretty much the definition of the activity here. Let's go back to our pyramid again. Uh, so now we have uh, four levels of hierarchy in our plan. So services, goals, objectives, and activities. We talked a second ago about the Deming cycle, or PDCA cycle, and again, our nomenclature is plan, do, study, adjust, or plan, plan, do, check, adjust, and there's a specific reason for that. I'll show you in a second. So let, let's take a, a, a real-life example here. In our community health division, we have a program called Safe Kids, and in that Safe Kids program, there's a component that talks about being able to provide car seats to folks who may not be able to afford quality car seats to protect their children. 
So let's build a little plan around that real quickly. Uh, number one, car seats are not cheap. So we're going to have to find somebody who's going to fund that, be it uh, the Safe Kids program federally, uh, maybe it's a, another grant, maybe it's a benefactor, um, you know, a foundation, somebody like that who can afford to, to basically buy 20 car seats a week. Well, let's, let's pick 20 as the number um, based on what we believe the market will bear, if you will. So our community, we think that 20 people a week can come in and get, you know, uh, qualified to get free car seats. So we got that piece of it. Number two is we have to allow the people out there to know that we have this program and who's eligible for it. So let's go to our PIO office and talk to them about maybe putting up a new um, web page on, on the county website and linking that. Um, maybe talking to the local media outlets for TV and um, radio coverage so that we can get some spots out there so people will know. The idea is to, to get the word out to everybody that, you know, if you qualify financially, you can get free car seats. Um, so we got the, the marketing piece of it there. And then the third part of it is public health people typically aren't car seat installers. And from a, a liability point of view and such, you probably don't want to be. So maybe what we'll do is is we'll find a third party organization who's you know licensed, bonded, insured to be able to to install car seats and contract with them to actually do the installation. So we've got our plan in place. We've got a financial component, a marketing component, installation component. So we're ready to go. Let's go ahead and kick off the plan and go to the the do or execute phase of the plan. And during this cycle, we're going to go to our financial partner and say, please provide enough money for 20 car seats a week to our third party installer who's going to go buy the car seat and then when people come they're going to install the car seats for us. So we've got the plan in place. Let's go ahead and start running the plan. So part of the plan is that we're going to determine that this third party installer is going to install X number of car seats a week and the system in this case by itself after you've set it up is going to send an email to this third party installer once a week, let's say on Friday afternoon, they're going to get this email. It's going to say, please enter the number of car seats you installed this week. So they're going to go in through what we call the quick update process and put in the number 20, if you will, or 25 or 22 or whatever that number is every week. And the system will do that every week. During that process, when, when the third-party installer puts in the, the number of car seats, the system is going to make some calculations based on that because we're going to tell it anything above 20 car seats a week is a green light. Anything below 10 car seats a week is a red light. Anything in between there is a yellow light. So the system is going to automatically uh, determine the status based on the information that we put in. And that's going to happen in the background real time. But we're, something we don't have to, to worry ourselves with, the system will take care of that for us. Here. So, we're going to execute the plan for 30 to 60 days, let's say. Then we're going to go down into the check phase here. And the check phase is merely comparing the, the plan to the actuals. So let's say at this point in time in our check phase, we average it out. We look and see we're only installing 15 car seats a week. In the case of a uh, performance monitoring system, this is where it stops. You, you've got your plan out there, great. You're executing your plan, great. Now all of a sudden things start going south. You're, you're not installing the number of car seats a week that you thought you could. In a performance monitoring system, you now have to go back and find your plan, figure out what the components of the plan are, and then make the adjustments. Since you happen to be in the plan, in this system, the next thing you have to do basically is just go in and say, oh, we're going to make adjustments here. So let's assume that in our financial component, maybe we underestimated the cost of car seats. So now car seats, uh, we realize, are a little bit more expensive, so we can only afford 15 a week. We can either make adjustments to the plan, the, the number that we anticipate uh, installing, or the resources, meaning we can either go find more money, or if not, we have to adjust the plan. The second component was our marketing component. So maybe we're just not getting the word out. Um, you know, we're not getting the demand. We're only getting demand for 15. It could either be that we could, uh, you know, more effectively do the marketing, or maybe that's just the limit of the market out there, that there's just not, you know, the demand for more than 15 a week. So again, we can either adjust the plan or adjust the resources, the resources being the marketing program. And number three is our third-party installer. Maybe they just don't have the bandwidth. They've got other things going on, and they can't take the time to install more than 15 a week. So again, either we adjust the plan down to 15, or we adjust the resources by either getting a new installer or supplementing that installer uh, with you know more bodies or something along that line. So 
That's the adjust phase, the adjust plan or adjust resources, and then again, we go right back through again. So this cycle continues, and the, and the system is continuously collecting data in real time, and it's going to show it to you anytime you want to go in and say, how are we doing on this plan? Here's a chart that shows you exactly how you're doing on this plan. I'll show you that chart in a few minutes here. So that's the Deming cycle integrated into this tool here. So now let's go look at that first half, that performance monitoring piece here. So that is typically done through the performance dashboard. And I'll show you that. I'm going to go to our group screen here. And our group screen, I'm going to select our department. And by clicking on the little traffic light up here, it's going to take me to that dashboard screen. The dashboard screen is broken down into three components. At the very top left corner up here, you'll see the traffic light. The traffic light is the overall summary of red, yellows, and greens. So how are we doing you know, based against the traffic lights that we've set on the uh, services, goals, and objectives and activities in there? Um, you'll notice up here the top right corner of this block, it says USA Public Health Department and subgroups. So what, what that's telling me is when I logged in, maybe I'm the uh, administrative officer or the um, chief health officer or somebody at, at that level. So when I log in, my default organization or my default uh, group is department. So what I'm seeing in this case is the entire department. So looking at that traffic light, I'm saying, okay, out of my whole department, 24 of the activities are uh, green. They're moving forward. 13 of them are already completed. Three of them, we have a caution flag, so we want to keep an eye on that. And we have one that apparently has come to a screeching halt. Um, if I was the WIC director and I logged in, my default group would be WIC, and what I would see in that traffic light is just things related to WIC. If I was the emergency preparedness director when I logged in, I would just see emergency preparedness. You have the option as a system administrator to give those people access to anything else that, that you want them to be able to see. So maybe everybody has access to their own division plus the whole department, something along that line. But up to you how you set that up. The, uh, the distribution you here see with 24 green, 3 yellow, and 1 red is pretty common. It means that everything is going pretty well, but we got a couple things we're going to keep an eye on. Let's say that yesterday when you logged in, you had 4 yellow and no red. And today you have a red in there. So obviously you're going to look at that and say, huh, I wonder what that is. Well, you can either go back and find your way through services, goals, objectives, activities, and figure out which one it is, or we made it easy for you, and that is you just click anything on the screen, and it takes you to the, the relevant, relevant information. So in this case, I clicked on that particular red activity, and it took me to the activity. I have all of the information at the bottom about who's the leader, who's the team members, who's the partners, uh, the beginning date, ending date, percent complete, and especially down here, I have my notes. And down here you'll see a note that says, you know, still waiting on final funding, getting critical, set to red. So I know why that person set it to red without having to go contact that person. And by clicking a little back arrow up here, it's going to take me right back to my dashboard screen. So the, again, the top left corner is that overall summary of how are we doing for my particular area of responsibility. At the bottom, we want to break that down a little bit so we get a little bit more detail. So we have three potential views to break that out. Number one view is by activity leader. So those people that we assign uh, on the activity screen as leaders are up here. So I have Diane Cox as the leader. I have a column over here that says, when's the last time Diane was in the system and updated her information? And it's color-coded, green, yellow, red, green being less than 30 days, yellow being less than 60 days, and red being over 60 days. I have an FTE column, and I neglected to show you that when I was assigning the activity leaders. Um, FTE, full-time equivalent, is the portion of that person's time dedicated to a specific activity. So in this case, maybe the activity we were talking about with Diane was a 0.2 FTE, which indicates Diane believes that she's going to be investing about one day a week in this activity. So what this column here does is rolls up all the activities Diane's been assigned, and gives you that aggregate total. Now, FTEs is completely optional for you. It, it's a great tool to be able to use for things like workforce development, but again, it, it's optional. Um, for me, I like to see how my folks are deployed, and I like to see you know, if they're overtaxed in, in what they're doing in here. So I'm going to look at this number. Um, the number is, again, color-coded, so if it's over 1.0, it's going to be red. 
So in this case, what you want to do is try to keep everybody somewhere between a, a 0.9 and a 1.0 FTE. That's kind of an ideal utilization for your employees. Unfortunately, in public health, um, most people will work as much as they need to work to get the job done. And you'll see a lot of 1.2 to 1.5 FTEs up here, which means people are working you know, 12-hour uh, days and that sort of thing, which, again, is not uncommon. However, if I'm a good manager and I look at all my people doing a 1.2 FTE up here, everything's in red, my concern would be not that I don't have great people because they're willing to do the work. My concern is that those people at some point in time are going to get burned out and change jobs or leave the organization. I don't want that to happen. So if I have this information in front of me, why wouldn't I go in and say, okay, let me go find a grant or uh, some interns or maybe some county funding that I can bring on another resource and distribute the workload a little bit more. So that's, that's kind of the purpose of that. In your workforce development plan, you might even put a, a, a goal in there that says keep everybody at a 0.9 to a 1.0 FTE and walk through the process on how you're going to do that. You know, when people get up to a, a 1.0 FTE, then you're going to look at their peers and see how you can distribute workload, that sort of thing. So it, it's a nice tool to be able to have. The next two columns are, are lagging, number of activities lagging behind schedule. Lagging is calculated in the system very simply, beginning date, ending date, percent complete. If I'm halfway through my time cycle and I'm 50% complete, I'm right on track. Halfway through my time cycle and only 40% complete, I'm lagging. Uh, again, lagging is, is uh, color-coded. Red is 30, yellow is 60, and over 60 is, is red, or a green, yellow, red. Um, the days column, for all of the activities that Diane has assigned up here, she is 33 days ahead of schedule, which is great. So Diane is not only working, you know, 15% over her normal workload, but she's maintaining that by staying 33 days ahead of schedule. That's the kind of people, obviously, you want on your team. Um, if I'm behind schedule by less than 60 days, I'm yellow. If I'm over 60 days, I'm red here. Uh, again, ahead of schedule by 17 days. So this is the aggregate for those people. So it's really a good number to find out how we're doing against our plans. The overdue column indicates that beginning or the ending date has come and gone and we're not yet 100% complete. So it's just going to throw that up there and, again, color-coded by how far. And then red, yellow, green, and gold is the same as the traffic light in the top left corner, except specifically for that person. So that's view number one is by leader. View number two is going to be by, if you will, our org chart. So what I want to be able to see is how is each different division, office, and program doing against their plans. So again, I have the same information, the last updated column, lagging, overdue, and red, yellows, and greens. But this time it's by group or by division, office, program. So I can look at each division and just kind of see how they're doing against their plans. And then my last one over here is by strategic priorities. So typically in your strategic plan, if you're putting it into this kind of a format, the service or initiative level is typically what we call strategic priorities. That's the top level of what we want to do as an organization going forward. So in this case, our little demo organization has five strategic priorities, partnerships, data quality, health disparities, regulatory compliance, and marketing communication. So those are the, the overall priorities that maybe myself as the chief health officer or health commissioner wants to accomplish with the department moving forward. So again, we have the same information over here as to how we're doing against those particular priorities. So everything is, you know, moving forward over here. We're mostly ahead of schedule, a little bit behind, but that's probably not bad if we're, you know, less than, say, 60 days behind schedule. We're probably in pretty good shape here, things that we can catch up on. So those are the three breakdowns of that traffic light to give you more detail, to give you a really good idea of how you're doing. Top right corner, my priorities, uh, and that, that's exactly what it means, is you as the logged in user can determine specific things you want to watch up there. So typically those are reds and yellows, and typically they're things that either you're directly working on or your team members are working on, the people who, who report to you. So I'm going to keep those up here. I'm going to have all the information about them, like you know the objectives as to what they are, uh, any notes about the objective, the traffic light flag, et cetera. So let's, let's look at this and say, hey, maybe yesterday I had one red and three yellows, and I log in today and I see that green up there. The green obviously means that you know it's back on track here. Um, it says baseline completed, so it's back on track. I don't need to watch that anymore. So basically, I, I have, again, everything's clickable. I click on that. It's going to take me to that particular objective. 
and then I'm just going to click on this little green flag. It turns to gray, and boom, it no longer shows up, hopefully, no longer shows up in that uh, My Priorities quadrant up there. So when I go back and look at that, now I'm back to here. I can go select any other objectives that I want to keep my eye on going forward here. So that's the, the biggest piece of the performance management. It's kind of a, when I log in, typically you'll set this as being your home screen. So I can log in and get a really good picture of how my uh, area of responsibility is doing. Oh, types of activities. Um, we talked about project-based activities. We've got to beat that to death, I think. So we're in pretty good shape. Beginning date, ending date, percent complete. Now, if we are in a case where we have a finite measurable element here, then we can go to a, a QM activity and let the system do a little bit more work for us. So let's use the example of uh, a WIC clinic, and they're going to target doing 50 nutrition consultations over the course of the fiscal year. So between July 1 and June 30th, our target is 50. So that gives us a finite number here, or what we call a target number here. We have still beginning date, ending date, so the fiscal year. Target number, metric type is nutrition consultations delivered. So in this case, uh, let's assume that uh, every month the system is going to email the WIC clinic director who's responsible for this activity and say, how many nutrition consultations did you did do this month? So they're going to go back in again through the quick update, and they're going to put in uh, five. And let's say we had 20 already, you know, year to date. Put five more in. The system adds that together, obviously. 25 divided by 50. Those were 50% complete. As long as we're less than halfway through the time cycle, we're on track. If we're 75% of the way through the time cycle, yet only 50% complete, it's going to show that we're behind schedule or lagging. The last type of activity in here is a little bit more unique. Uh, let's use our example again of installing 20 car seats a week. So instead of having to go in and set a beginning date and ending date every week for the activity, you know, for the next Sunday through Saturday or, or Monday through Friday, whatever it is, the system you're going to say, I'm going to do this weekly, and you're going to pick a weekly frequency. So what's going to happen is at the end of that cycle, the system will email that uh, the third-party installer, say, how many car seats did you install? Once he answers that, it's going to go in and reset those dates to the next Sunday through Saturday automatically for you, or it could be bi-monthly, monthly, monthly, actually out to five years for some strategic planning things. Uh, this is where I would set the high and the low value of what is a green, what is a red. And in this case, the system automatically sets those traffic lights for you. So let's say I set the high value to my, my mark of 20 car seats a week. My low value, if I'm doing less than 10 car seats a week, we're not, we're not doing it right. So what's going on? And anything between 10 and 20 would be yellow. So that's how I set that. And when the, the person, again, gets the... Uh, email, they go link back into the system and get the uh, enter the number of car seats. It's automatically going to set that traffic light for you. And then we can go back and look at that in a, a graphical format or in a textual format. And I'll show you that here as, as well in a second. So those are three types of activities that you can select from. Uh, nobody's come up with a fourth yet over the many, many years that it's been out there. Uh, but we're you know more than, more than willing to um, add to that if, if it makes sense to do that for everybody. We talked about three-dimensional planning on that first screen. Let me uh, try to visualize what that looks like. So let's assume that in the system we put our strategic plan in there. We've got operational plans for WIC and uh, community health and emergency preparedness. Of, you know, what, what do they actually do? We have a workforce development plan. We have a QI plan maybe. We have a CHIP plan in there. So these plans are in the system. So what I want to be able to do is go and look across all of these plans for something like uh, public health essential number one which pieces of which plans are contributing to essential number one. So I want to be able to go back and look at that and find out how we're doing against essential number one, because that's kind of one of the measurements you know, the health departments go by. Um, you know, when FAB came about in 2011, obviously we want to be able to track how we're doing against the FAB standards and measures. So in this case, I could say these specific pieces of each of the plans are attributed to FAB standard 6.1. And I can assign you know, as many pieces of the plan to as many different standards as I want. So I can have one piece that you know, meets all the standards or five of the standards or whatever. We talked about the strategic priorities. So in this case, uh, our partnering strategic priority is right there. Um, what I'm going to do is say, these pieces of these plans all relate to partnering. So when I show it on that dashboard screen like you just saw, that's how it, it rolls up the information. It goes picks just those pieces of the plan that are 
uh, related to partnering, and it's going to show you the, the data element for that. And then the last one is document management here. I want to be able to categorize all of the documents that I have put into the system against, for instance, the FAB standards. I might want to categorize them against a bunch of other things which are in the system as well, but maybe the FAB standards. So when the FAB reviewer comes out and says, hey, what are you doing for standard 4.2? I can go in and do what we call a category tag report and say, show me everything we're doing for category standard 4.2. And it's going to show me every document that I have and every planning element that I have and when it was last updated, the status, everything that you wanted to know about it. So that's, that's three-dimensional planning. It allows you to have that big picture view across everything that you have in the system. I'll show you how that actually works here. I'm going to go to my services uh, directory up here. And then down here at the bottom, I have uh, this little up arrow with a paper clip on it. Uh, the little blue eye indicates that it's been categorized. The rollover indicates how it's been categorized. And if I click on it, it's going to take me to the selection screen here. So on the left side, you'll see a bunch of typical public health categories. Uh, you have things like, again, your strategic priorities at the top, which will be your specific uh, agency strategic priorities. You have those essentials of public health and accreditation here that you can select. Lots of different other things. And, and by the way, these are completely editable by you. So we provide a standard list of these for you. If you want to go back in and um, change these to anything you want to do, feel free. You can make any edits you want on them. Down at the bottom, we have all of the FAB domains. And for each domain, we not only have the standards for that domain, but as of you know January 1st, they had the reaccreditation measures that they came out, the 31 new measures. So we put those in there as well. So I can go in even in the initial accreditation process now, and tag documents and plans against the reaccreditation measure. So, you know, five years from now when that comes around, I'm, I'm most of the way ready to go, you know, for the um, FAB reviewers to come in. So that's what you do is you, you tag everything with the, the category tags here, and then you can go back through what we call a category tag report and retrieve all that information. So it allows you, again, to look across everything. Okay, back to our PowerPoint here. Uh, performance history. Every one of the, the objectives and activities in the system has a performance history chart. So I'll show you what that looks like again in, in real time. Um, I'm going to go to our group screen. I'm going to select our community health division. Then I'm going to go to my services screen and select that Safe Kids program up here. So the Safe Kids program has got a set of goals. Each one of those goals then has a set of objectives. Each objective then has a set of activities. I'm going to go down and look at uh, Andrea's car seats will install 20 car seats per week. That's my activity. All the information down here. A couple of buttons to highlight down here. Number one is this hourglass, which is the history. Everything that's happened to this particular activity since it was put in the system back on 1-3 of 2006 by Fred Erickson uh, was added to the system. Every person who makes any changes to it and every date that it was changed gets logged in here. What they did to it. The, the traffic light, in this case of installing car seats, you remember we started out a little bit red because it was a brand new program, get into yellows, and then we're running into the greens here. Um, all the notes about that, all the actual data values we put in. So this is just kind of the, the text view. And this is handy when you go back and, you know, maybe somebody accidentally made a change to a flag or something in the system and, and you want to go back and find out what happened. You can go back and retrace the steps of everything that's happened here. If I go back to my activity screen again, I have another button here, this chart button, and the chart button shows me that performance history chart. So what, you just, what you're seeing right here is that same data that was in the, the history file graphed. Well, in this case, we started out you know, in the red, we moved up into the yellow, and now we're up in the green. This is the um, high and low values we set, the 20 and the 10. So I, I can look at this, I can you know, make a lot of changes to see what date ranges I want to look at and various types of, of data and things like that. But it gives you that ability. You also have the ability to put in the history uh, record here, put in previous data. So if you've been doing the car seat program for three years and you just implemented the system today, you're going to want to be able to go back and put in history data that you can look at. You have the ability to do that so now you can create the graphs and look at your trend lines and things like that over time. Real-time planning. 
Um, we had mentioned at the outset that one of the keys to, to making a plan successful, we believe, is to keep all the data real time. Make people use the plan, if you will. So here's how we do that. Uh, and I'll show you how we're going to do this. The system actually, you set up a set of email reminders. And they'll go out based on a specific set of criteria automatically. The system does it for you. You don't have to do anything to it. But what it's going to do is send out an email to both internal people here and any external people you assign as, as users in the system. What they're going to do is go back in through the email, click on a link in there. It's going to take them back into what we call the quick update system. Quick update system just says, you know, here's up to three fields of data you have to enter, and that's all. It's the traffic light, you know, the, uh, the number, and maybe a note if you want to put that in. We're going to update that, and then it's going to update the, the whole database here. So let's go and look and see how that worked. I go up to my main menu as a system administrator, and I go to my settings here. Under settings, I go to notification. It's very simple to set up. So here's where I am. I say, yes, I want email notifications, or no, I don't want that. When do I want them to go out? I can say any any specific day of the month or every day of the month or once a week or however I want it to do. So anywhere between every day and once a month, you can set that up. Okay? So I currently set it up to go out the first week of the month and on Wednesday. It's a very common setting because you're you're done with the previous month, a couple of days to you know get things you know wrapped up, and then maybe Wednesday morning you get this email comes out and says, eh, okay, here's what you got to do. Here's what generates the email. Three things, depending on what you check here. Number one is, have you been in the system in the last 30 days? If not, you're going to get an email. Um, do you have any activities lagging behind schedule? If you do, you're going to get an email. If you have anything that's overdue, you're going to get an email. And again, depending on what you check. So what's going to happen is, at, and in this case, on Wednesday morning at 2 a.m., the system is going to go in and look at every user and say, number one, have you been in in 30 days? Number two, lagging. Number three, overdue. If any of those are true, you're going to get an email. If all of those are not true, you won't spam. You don't get an email at all. So here's what the email looks like. Very simple. First thing it shows you is why you're getting this email. So it says, you know, here's the 30 days. Well, I'm only 17 days, so I'm good. Ah, I have two activities lagging and one activity overdue. That's why I got the email. Of all the activities I've been assigned as the leader, Here's what they look like, one red, four yellow, six green, and two gold. If I have any questions, I've got an internal contact, and these are people that you assign as administrators. I have an internal contact who's kind of the, the expert for my division, maybe. And I can contact them to say, hey, why did I get this email? And then the last thing is this link right back into the dashboard. So when I'm done here, I look at the email. OK, I click on the link. It takes me to my login screen. My login screen says user ID and password. Then it looks and says, have you been assigned any activities? If you have been assigned activities, it's going to pop up this window. It says, do you want to go to the dashboard or the quick update screen? From here, most people will go to the quick update screen. And when I go there, I'll show you again what that looks like. So I'm going to go to my main menu where I can select quick update as well. My quick update screen here. And the quick update screen is, is very, very simple. At the very top is nothing more than context. So where is this activity in the system? It's under the group department, service goal, objective. It's number one of eight that I'm going to update today. So I know, you know going forward, I'm just going to be updating these eight activities and getting out of there. Here's the activity. It's project-based. Here's the performance metric. And then down at the bottom are the, the fields that I update. Anywhere between one and three fields uh, are updatable at this point in time, depending on the type of activity. So in this case, I would you know, select the traffic light, do the percent complete, put a note in there if necessary, hit the little save button down here. You notice now it takes me to number two of eight. Uh, so I'm just going to put in the information and go through. The design metric for this particular piece was people could log in, update their information, and log out in three to five minutes. And it works beautifully. Uh, before, we didn't have this system. And people had to go back in and log in and navigate their way through and find their activities. And it took you know, a half an hour, and people just honestly weren't doing it. So by implementing this particular piece of the system, we upped the amount of data that was being entered in the system by about 10 times for an order of magnitude. So it really worked out beautifully. Um, back here, oh, uh, one more tool that's available to kind of help you to encourage people to, to keep their information up to date is what we call a dashboard activity report, or in effect, it's not a report. 
So it shows you every group in the system, and then it shows you who's in that group, who they report to, uh, the last time they were in the system updating information, and what they did the last time they were in the system. So it gives you, again, an audit tool to be able to go back and say, hey, Steve has not been in for a long time here. Um, I tried to call Steve and, you know, didn't get anywhere. So maybe I'm going to call Diane and say, hey, Diane, can you convince Steve we need his information updated in the system? So, again, it's an audit report to help you to keep people on track here. Um, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. <laughs> Document management we talked about. Let's go ahead and look at that. So I'm going to go back to my services tab up here. Down here on, on pretty much every screen, you'll see the um, little blue folder here. Little blue folder is document management. Uh, the three on there indicates that there's three documents attached to it. The rollover tells me what those documents are. And if I click on it, it'll take me to document management. Well, the first thing you see is that there's only one document up here. The reason you only see one is because it is version three of this document. The, the green indicates it's the latest version. So if I want to see the previous versions, all I got to do is click on that. It shows me now that there really are three documents. Just the, the first two are hidden because really the only thing you want to see is the last one. But I can see all of them here. Down at the bottom, I have a description of the document. I have any notes about that document. So if I go in and update section six in the document, I'm just going to put a note in there. It says I updated section six. The next person that goes in looks at it and says, oh, okay, I'll check it out and update um, Section 7. I have the, the date down here, which is a requirement for FAM to be able to have every document dated. I have the file name of the document and that sort of thing. I also have a traffic light for the document, a status flag. Now, status flags for documents are a little bit different than for the normal uh, stuff in the system. They're used a couple of different ways. In the initial documentation process where you're just collecting documents and getting ready to upload to, to eFab, what people are using them for is the red traffic light means it's just a, maybe a template or a, a draft, you know, first draft of the document. The yellow traffic light indicates an ongoing working draft. Green indicates a final document ready to go into eFab. And then gold indicates that it's been uploaded to eFab. So you can use them that way at the, at the outset until you get all your documents uploaded. Once they're all uploaded and FAB starts grading your documents, you know, as fully demonstrated, partially, whatever, you can then say, okay, now I'm going to convert those flags over to um, gold meaning fully demonstrated, yellow meaning partially demonstrated, or I'm sorry, green meaning partially demonstrated, yellow meaning uh, slightly demonstrated, and red meaning not demonstrated. So it gives me the ability up here to be able to select by status. So I can say, I want to see just all the green which means those are the documents that are ready to upload to eFab. So I can look at those, I can click here, download the document, and then poof, upload it into eFab, and I'm done. Program abstract. Um, kind of simple, but, but what we did is we take all the data that we have in the, in the system around the different programs, and we embellish it with things like a, a description, uh, eligibility requirements, any web links, so that now, if somebody calls up your PIO office and says, what kind of programs do you have for tobacco cessation in high schools? Uh, high school principals calling. You know, we got a problem with smoking, I need some help. Um, PIO office typically doesn't know everything that's going on at each of the division level. So they'll call the Office of Tobacco and Chronic Disease Prevention, say, what kind of programs do you have? And they'll say, oh, we got these three great programs. Let me tell you about it. Well, I need something I can send off to this person. So they're going to have to create something to send off to the principal. In this case, you would have a category and a subcategory of tobacco and tobacco prevention or tobacco cessation. And you're going to go select that and say, show me all the program abstracts we have for tobacco cessation. You get them here with your nice graphic header on them for your department. Um, you have all the information, who to contact, everything you need to know. You could uh, email it, you can PDF it, you can print it, whatever you want to do with it. So a nice feature, not necessarily a performance management feature, but kind of nice to have. Uh, reporting. Obviously, you're going to have a, a ton of data in the system. You want to be able to get it out. Most of the reports are just kind of exactly like the pyramid, if you will, the operational plan report. So what you have at the top is the groups. So for each group, then you have the services, each service, the goals, the objectives, the activities, all the notes. Everything that you have basically in the system is going to show up on this report. So you can look at it. You can collapse the report. You can expand it all the way down to this level or say, I just want to see the services on there. Uh, you can show the notes or not show the notes or put the notes in columns versus rows, different things like that. But lots of options, if you will. 
Um, lots of different reports. A um, couple of them that, that I'd like to highlight. Uh, number one here, the team lead report. Um, assuming that you as a manager will have quarterly one-on-ones with your team members, wouldn't it be nice if you had a report that showed you everything you're, that they're doing, the status of what they're doing, the last time they were in the system, um, right in front of you. So when you're having that meeting, it's like, you know, here's what you're doing. Everything's up to date. You updated this three days ago. Can I assume everything is correct? Yeah. And then the rest of your meeting is very productive, like what can we do moving forward? How can we enhance your career here at Public Health? That sort of thing. Same thing with partner activities. You know, if you do quarterly partner meetings, you got the same information. What all are we doing with Fred Erickson at KCA? Here's a list of everything we're doing, the status, and the last time he updated the information. So those are really handy reports to have if you want to use them. Uh, the last screen we're going to talk about here is the help and information screen. Uh, the reason we put that in the system is because we realized going into it that there's going to be lots of different types of users. There's going to be people probably like yourselves um, who are going to be administrators and they're going to have full access to the system and really understand all the, the bells and whistles and, and understand what's going on under the covers. You're going to have some people who are only going to get in the system when they get that email that says, please update your activities in the system. And so they're going to go in, you know, once a month, once a week, whatever you set that up. You're probably going to have your uh, division managers, division directors, who might go in maybe once a quarter to, you know, and update their operational plans for their divisions and things. So lots of different, uh, you know, types of people are going to be in the system. So what we wanted to have happen is I want to be able to get help immediately from anywhere. And this is kind of an underused feature, but uh, we were talking yesterday to one of our departments, and they didn't even know that uh, this really existed out there. And they were just amazed that, oh, this is exactly what we've been looking for. Basically, in any function I'm in in the system, I can click on the little blue eye up here in the top right corner. It takes me to the help and information screen. And it takes me to that specific function because that's what I was watching, so it's context sensitive. Uh, first thing it shows me is this list of exactly what I need to do. And by the way, this, this health department we met with yesterday was this is exactly what they were trying to create. They were asking us how to do it. We said, why would you want to recreate the wheel? It's already there for you. So the bullet list of, of exactly what you want to do, if I'm the type of person who likes to have a, a user guide that I can navigate, boom, I click on this little guy down here, pops open a PDF of my user guide. It's got everything in the whole system in here, and it's all hyperlinked. So all I have to do is click on that uh, table of contents link here, and it takes me right to that particular section. Uh, I can PDF this or just save it on my desktop and leave it up you know, so I can get to it any time I want to. Um, I can print it off if I like to have paper on my desktop, I can do that. So that's available to you. And then the third option, and, and really the best option, is this little icon here, which is a video icon. And what it is is a three to four minute on average video of exactly how to do what you're trying to do in the system. So in this case, I'm adding and managing services. It's going to be a video of somebody going through and adding a service for you in here. You can watch the video. You can toggle back over to the dashboard, do what the video says, go back. Unfortunately, those videos don't play well over GoToMeeting, but I'm happy to share those links with you if you would like to see any of them. But there's videos for every function in the system that, again, is average three to four minutes, tells you exactly how to do that, and it's somebody actually doing it. So it's really a nice learning methodology, kind of what we call instant expert, you know, having that um, the ability to go grab John in the office next door who's the expert on everything and say, hey, John, come here and help me to add this new service. I forgot how to do it. Boom, three minutes later, you know. The other thing we did with all those nice little videos is roll them into training curriculums. So you see up here at the top, we have the user level video training, admin level, operational plan development training, and occasional user training. This one's about an hour and 20 minutes. This one's about 20 minutes. Op plans are about 40 minutes. And this one's like a five minute training for a quick update. But what you can do is, and, and what we recommend is when people get started in the system, they actually take the time to go through the, the videos. And you can do, you know, a couple of them a day or, you know, whenever you get time, you can go through and do the videos because they're all these three to four minute modules. So you can break it down any way you want. But what really works well is the people who are going to be using the system go through those uh, couple of videos, at least the user level training and the op plan development training. That gives you a really, really good clear picture of what you're going to be doing. Um, once we, once everybody goes through that training, then we typically will set up a go to meeting like this. We'll answer any questions and clarify things that you know didn't come through. 
and go through some real life examples in the system of how you do everything. Uh, seems to be a, a great training methodology because right after that, people are, are very, very productive in the system and get going. So that, I believe, was your drink out of a fire hose that I promised. <laughs>